Maganu, one of the many talented artists to come out of the Swing Mob Collective, would rise to fame with his crew members in the late 90s and early 2000s. He always supported his industry peers in their projects and group collaborations, and spread love where he could. Sadly, the world wasn't so loving to Magu, and in the 13th chapter of the Unfortunate Demise series, we will dive deep into his formative years, the pains he suffered, the fame he achieved, and his overall quest to get away from the world to ultimately find peace of mind before his untimely demise at 50 years of age. If there are any other artists you would like to see covered in the Unfortunate Demise series, please leave your suggestions in the comments below. Let's get started. He was born Melvin Barcliffe on July 12, 1973 in Norfolk, Virginia, and right off the bat, his first few years were filled with many traumatic experiences. A glimpse into these years can be heard on the song Hold On, in which he detailed his suffering at the hands of his parents and mentioning that by the time he was three years old, he had been stabbed once by his mom and twice by his dad. Eventually, him and his sisters would be placed in the care of his aunt and uncle when he was four years old. He later said in an interview that without them, he most likely would have been taken into state custody and wouldn't have been in the position to become the star he later became. His love for rap came in 1979 when the song Rapper's Delight by the Sugar Hill Gang was released, and it was the first time Melvin had ever heard a rap song on the radio, which was a memory he cherished. He said, it just changed my whole perspective on life. I was six or seven at the time and only three years away from being with my real mother who was abusive and hadn't completely gotten over those experiences but rap music became my blanket. And as he got older, he began honing his skills as a rapper and it became a creative outlet for him. His Aunt Magdalene was his saving grace and support system. She went by Aunt Mag and it would inspire his rap name, Magoo. And the added O's symbolized the awe he believed listeners would feel upon hearing his music. He would attend Deep Creek High School in Chesapeake where he made friends with other teenagers who were interested in rap too. One of the friends was Larry Lyons, who was from Virginia Beach and would later be known as Larry Live. And after months of bonding over their love for rap, Larry told him about a well-known DJ back in his hometown named DJ Timmy Tim, who would later become Timbaland. And once Magoo was introduced to him, he was blown away with Tim's talents and the fact that Tim was an amazing producer. He had never seen someone so multi-talented and truly dedicated to his craft. And Tim was better than what he told me. He, wow. he was the, he was the, it, like people don't understand. Tim could have been like Kid Capri or, or Frontmaster Flex or uh, I'm gonna say Jazzy Jeff. I'm telling you, he was that level good. He was an elite DJ. He was elite, and people would use his name to say he was DJing at parties he was not at. And uh, Tim just had the game on like when it came to that. And then when I heard him do his, you know, when I met him, he, he was DJing. Tim was like. Yo, I'm going to try to hear some of these beats I'm working on. And I was like, dang, this dude makes beats and he DJ. <laughs> I had never met nobody, anybody in person that was that serious about the art and that was that talented at the art. However, when it came time for Magoo to showcase his talents, Tim wasn't feeling it at first, thinking his bars were whack. Not to mention, A Tribe Called Quest was hot on the music scene around this time, and Magoo drew comparisons to one of the rappers, Q-Tip. Not for his flow, but for his high-pitched voice which sounded similar. Magoo would later say, people don't get that this is just how I sound. I've always sounded like this even before I started rapping. I was in a singing group and I was singing Ralph Tresvant. I was winning talent shows singing before I was rapping. I didn't come in second or third. I was literally winning the talent shows singing New Edition songs. I hate the Q-Tip comparisons because I'm a big Tribe Called Quest fan, but there was nothing I could do about my voice. Eventually, he came with better bars, and him, Tim, and Larry would eventually start a group called SBI, which stood for Surrounded by Idiots, and also featured a revolving door of other talented local rappers. At one point, Timbaland would introduce the group to a young Pharrell Williams, who was part of another group that would later become the Neptunes, and he would do many collaborations with SBI. Some of their early sessions can be found on YouTube, and it was a great outlet for all the guys, especially Magoo, to experience the joys of writing, producing, and recording your own music. 
their crew would be among the first to jumpstart the hip-hop scene that was coming out of the 757. Also around this time, a local girl group named FaZe had a song that was being played on local radio stations. It was a big deal because it was the only song that was from a local artist on regular rotation in Virginia Beach. The group's lead singer was then unknown Missy Elliott. And while Magoo was working at Olive Garden, one of his co-workers, who was a part-time producer, pulled up with FaZe in his car. Magoo ran out to meet the girls, as he was a fan, and after spending some time with Missy and being impressed by her musical talents, he would give her the nickname Miss Demeanor, as he felt it was a crime for her to have so many talents. And Missy was equally impressed with Magoo's sound, as it was like Q-Tip who she loved, but with a Virginia twist that was unique. Now according to Magoo, Missy was already great back then, she just didn't have the resources to get the production that she needed, and Magoo had the bright idea to suggest that she meet Timbaland, whose production style would go great with the group's sound, although he didn't realize that doing so was undercutting his co-worker, who was the group's producer at the time. But he said that everything happens for a reason, and that this was God's way of putting the wheels in motion, and once Missy met Timbaland, and at their studio he put on that first beat, their collaborative connection was instant and he would go on to produce much of the group's new material. They would also change their name to Sista. And while attending a Jodeci concert, they auditioned backstage for one of the group's members, Devante Swing, who was discovering new talent and starting up a musical collective of artists called Swing Mob. Impressed with the group's talent, he would sign them. But Missy also told him about Timbaland, and initially Devante wasn't wanting to add new producers, preferring to use I'll Be Sure instead. But, with Tim producing the group's music, Missy and the group weren't going without him. Even though she had love for I'll Be Sure, she saw the future for what Tim's production could do. And so, Devante, trusting Missy, would bring Tim on as well. Now, Missy had also mentioned SBI as a whole. And once the group auditioned for Devante, he pulled Magoo to the side and informed him that he only wanted to sign him and not the other group members, as he saw something in Magoo that he could mold. Now, Magoo didn't want to do the deal without his boys, as he was loyal. But a few years later, Devante would reveal to Magoo that Missy had told him that out of all the boys in SBI, Magoo was the star, as she saw his true potential, his loving spirit, and knew that he would go far under Devante's tutelage. Now, the Swing Mob, also known as The Basement Crew, consisted of 20 plus members, including artists like Genuine and Tweet, who was in a group called Sugar. It also consisted of producers like Jimmy Douglas, who would contribute to much of Tim and Magoo's music later on down the line, and Stevie J. Devante initially had everyone in New Jersey, but would set up shop in a two-story house in Rochester and recorded Jodeci's albums and the music from other artists in a studio at the house. He would choose a more remote location away from the influences of New York City in order to help the crew establish their own sound. And while the different artists collaborated and worked together, Devante would often give them tough love as he wanted them to strengthen and showcase their true potential. But Magoo had a habit of hyping up other rappers that he either heard about or witnessed within the collective. And one time Devante cussed him out, saying, Magoo, that's why you ain't sh and you ain't never gonna be sh because you're sitting there jocking the next man when you need to be hyping your own stuff. And though the words may have been harsh in that moment, Magoo took it in stride as he knew Devante and others saw greatness in him as more than just a supporting artist. And Magoo would get to flex his skills, appearing for the first time on the remix to Jodeci's What About Us in early 1994. <laughs> Being a part of the basement crew taught him a lot, but times were tough as well. There were periods where funds were so tight and there was little to no food and everyone was sleeping on cots. But Magoo, who had endured much worse conditions, understood that it was all a part of the process. Eventually, some of the artists started getting part-time jobs just to have some kind of funds coming in. Both Magoo and Genuine would do landscape work for the studio's owner, David Shoemaker. But when one of the artists went off and got their own deal, Devante felt betrayed, and he started looking at everyone else like, oh, is that what y'all trying to do? He had been hanging with Suge Knight around this time and had adopted his abusive tactics when dealing with his own artists. And Stevie J said that one night, things got extreme. After a dispute with his artists over a contract issue, Devante called an urgent meeting 
and the scene reportedly turned physical. All right, so all of them was in the studio. You know what I'm saying? So, you know what I'm saying? He walk in, he's smacking everybody. Mm. Genuine, Timbaland, Missy. What, literally smacking them? Smacking them. No, sh Are we was saying Devonte was the R and B yeah. show tonight? Yeah, <laughs> to me, he's walking yeah. in the studio just the, randomly with the pit bulls. Oh no, 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 not randomly with the pit bulls. Oh, damn, he he's, got dogs too. And with the body guards. Yeah. 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 When he came in the room, he was throwing chairs. Me and Missy almost got hit in our head with a chair because it was thrown over our head. His bodyguards went down the row and like really smacked all the guys and like kind of dared them to hit him back it wasn't nothing that we did to deserve that none of us a dog didn't deserve what went on in that room that day for missy the scene was all too familiar i went through watching my father do this with my mother i remember telling timberland that uh i'm gonna leave and i'm never coming back following this situation members would leave the basement crew one by one and from 1995 to 1997, as Timbaland and Missy branched out into writing and producing for other artists like Aaliyah and their mob member Genuine, Timbaland would also snag a deal with Blackground Records, with Magoo tagging along. Now, just as a duo, they began recording their debut project. Prior to this, Magoo had been more rough around the edges with his wordplay and his rhymes, but after seeing the business aspect of the industry and in knowing how it works, he knew he had to distinguish himself from the rapper he was always compared to. He said, I just wanted people to have a good time and party. That's what my intentions were. If I wanted to be a dope MC, I could have bodied a lot of people. I always had the lyrical ability, but I knew that is not what everyone needs to do. Somebody has to make the fun records, and I knew I couldn't go a certain way because of Q-Tip. I tried to find a way to get away from it as much as possible. I literally was trying to get away from that because I had so much respect for Tribe. So I had to be the happy rapper. It would have backfired if I tried any other way. The duo would drop their debut hit, Up Jumps the Boogie, on July 11th, 1997, which features Magoo, Timbaland, and Missy rapping two verses each and Aaliyah on the hook. The video would also feature many of their former mob members, who had now regrouped as the Super Friends. The song shot all the way to number one on the rap chart, number 4 on the R&B chart, and number 12 on the Hot 100, and went gold, selling over 800,000 copies. And it was amazing to see just how far they had came from the streets of Virginia to the forefront after years of hard work and dedication. Their debut album, Welcome to Our World, dropped on November 11th, 1997, and featured an array of artists and collaborators. It would also go platinum and produce two more singles, Clock Strikes and Love to Love Ya. They traveled across the U.S. doing several live performances of their songs, and while many people loved them, they weren't taken as seriously for some hip-hop heads, and their lyrical content was more carefree, peculiar, and sometimes vulgar, which caused a disconnect to some listeners. Magoo would later say, We made fun records, but they weren't corny. I don't have any regrets. I like the reaction I got from people that were fans. I didn't get the street credibility that I got into hip-hop for, but I felt if I can make people happy and have a good time that I was contributing to hip-hop too, but in a different way. Unfortunately, this didn't stop Magoo from being the punching bag on certain platforms, with some interviewers trying to be slick with it. Everybody thought y'all were on somebody else's video. Oh, we had, remember the first video, everybody thought that was so, oh, who are them two brothers? Timberland Magoo? Yeah, they're in the background because y'all had 900 folks. <laughs> y'all had 900 people in the video, man. Y'all was producing all this other good stuff. Now, I understand uh, Magoo had some whack rapping skills in, yeah, I did. in, in the junior high. <laughs> I ain't gonna lie. <laughs> when I first met, didn't he come up to you and say, I can rap? Yeah, he was whack to me. Go ahead, use your mic, man. No, you, 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 you. <laughs> no, he came up to me back in um, high school or junior high. He said, I can rap, man. I can rap. I got <laughs> no talent. No, nah, he, was, he was all right, but I thought he was whack to me. And, and then after the last time. Y'all got together. So I'm glad it worked out. Genuine, brother. Right, Your stuff is live. We know we got here. Right, Y'all, miss you still, but you brave, you know. Still, those who rocked with it, rocked with it. One of the songs I liked from the project was the album version of Clock Strikes. It has a nice mellow groove to it, and Magoo sets the vibe for the track. The duo would also be featured on Genuine's G Thang, and Timbaland would release his own solo album called Life from the Basement. Magoo and Missy would appear on the hit single Here We Come, which did decent numbers as well. The Super Friends would always show support on different projects, 
and in their personal lives too. When Magoo was going through a bad breakup, the members of R&B group Playa invited him to come stay with them while the group were putting together their first album, and being around them was very therapeutic for him. They had a blast working on the project, and in the process, Magoo would end up rapping on their album, titled Cheers to You, appearing on two of the interludes for the project. He said, Playa made me happy because I never saw those dudes not happy. I owe part of my success to them. They were an influence on me because of their hard work. Magoo would also support Missy Elliott on her promo tour, appearing as her hype man on many of her TV performances and live appearances. Missy would return the favor by asking him to lay bars for her single, Beat Me 911, which also featured 702, and Missy said that when she heard the finished record, she had played his verse over and over, as she loved it. The song reached number 13 on the R&B chart and the top 5 in the UK. Though Magoo often found himself shuttling between different artist projects, unlike his peers, he didn't have any solo hits, much less a solo album, leading many to believe that he couldn't stand on his own, and that he was nothing more than a guest artist. And Magoo didn't go out of his way to sway the public any different either. He knew his lane and he stayed in it. But beyond the fame, the money, and the women, he wasn't happy. He said, I never really got a chance to enjoy this success because it came at a cost. The video shoots and the flying, I never really got the chance to digest the success. Still to this day, I can tell someone that we sold 1.6 million and have a platinum single too. A lot of people go their whole career without having 25% of that, and I've been blessed to have it, but I never got a chance to enjoy it. I never felt like me and Tim got a chance to enjoy our early years, and it never even felt like we were in this million selling group. Not just from a financial standpoint, but more so because you're always working. You go from that album and then they want another one, and then you have people trying to rip you apart all at the same time. As by 1999, the pair were already working on their sophomore album, called Indecent Proposal. By now, Timbaland had so much success producing hit after hit for other artists, but wanted to do another record with Magoo, cause that's the homie and they were friends. Plus he felt they owed the public another album, but Tim also wanted it to be his last album as a rapper. Ahead of the release, Tim and Magoo had dropped We At It Again for the Romeo Must Die soundtrack, which also featured Static Major, and the reception was very positive from fans and critics. This would further fuel anticipation for the new album, which featured a plethora of hip-hop artists like Jay-Z, Twista, Petey Pablo, Mad Skills, Ludacris, and Playa. It also initially featured famed rock musician Beck on the song I Am Music, but Tim liked the song better without him on there, so he would be omitted from the project. Now Magoo's verses were still crude and raunchy in nature, bringing the same heat he brought from the first album, but he also threw shots at his naysayers in between his witty lines, giving the people what they want. The album would be propelled by their lead hit, Drop, featuring the crunk hype man, Fat Man Scoop, which became an anthem for all the breakdancers in the early 2000s, and years later, it would be used in the cult classic film, You Got Served. The album was completed by early 2000, but faced several delays and wasn't released until November of 2001, due to changes at their label, Blackground Records. By this time, so much had happened in their camp. Their longtime friend and collaborator, Aliyah, who was also their label's greatest asset, had perished in a plane crash. And due to the recent events of 9-11, the US was in a recession which Timbaland felt hindered the promotion for the album and their second single called All Y'all that featured their former mob member Tweet, who by now had re-emerged as a solo artist. The timing on all of this wasn't good at all. The album charted at number 29 and has sold around 350,000 copies to date, which were rookie numbers. But the duo were too consumed in grief to worry with the numbers, as Aliyah's death greatly affected the Super Friends crew and where it had inspired Missy, Tim, and Genuine to grind harder and bury themselves in the music, Magoo didn't want to hear a single melody. And I, and I do miss, I never got over her death. Um, and like I said, I never discussed this with Tim or Missy, with Genuine, or with any of my friends. I never discussed it with them, with any of my family, with any of my ex-girlfriends, or even my current girlfriend. I never discussed it with anybody. I never got over that. How hard it was on me, and how I couldn't fly, how I couldn't listen to it. I could not watch any of them videos. I didn't watch Rock the Boat, any of that stuff. Um, the lady I was with during that particular time, she would get upset because I was like, I didn't want to see TV or shows. I didn't watch video shows. Then I didn't want to see nothing that was a musical after that woman died like she did. 
right. uh, record label. And honestly, I, I lost a piece of myself then. Magoo would go on a year-long hiatus before regrouping with Timbaland for one final album in late 2003. Missy had released the Grammy-nominated album Under Construction the previous year, which was largely produced by Timbaland. So this one was titled Under Construction Part 2 and featured Missy on the lead single, Cop That Shit. The song refers to people downloading and burning music instead of buying it, and all three of their verses sample cadences from classic rap songs, but with new lyrics. For example, Timbaland's verse is a rewrite of I Know You Got Soul by Eric B. and Rakim. Missy's verse is a rewrite of Paper Thin by MC Light, and Magoo's verse was a rewrite of I Got It Made by Special Ed. And each artist that they sampled made their respective appearances in the video, which also features a painting of Aliyah depicted as an angel appearing in the backdrop. Though it was a nice effort from the crew, the single underperformed, peaking at a disappointing 95 on the Billboard Hot 100. Their second single, Indian Flute, didn't fare much better. Though it's an infectious tune and was a fan favorite, which had all the workings to be a smash, it just didn't connect with mainstream listeners. Also, the melodies and instrumentation were from a popular Colombian song, and so the flute wasn't even Indian. The album itself received mixed reviews and sold less than the last album. And on many of the songs, you can tell that Magoo was symbolically bowing out, like on the songs Insane and Hold On, which are among my favorites in their entire catalog, where both Timbaland and Magoo rap about their disdain for the wicked ways of the music industry as a whole, and even society in general. Indian Flute would be the last music video to feature Magoo. He had stated a few times that he had Indian heritage, so perhaps it was fitting as a final curtain call. The duo had a promo single, Naughty Eyes, which wouldn't get a video. And with that, Magoo was through and would walk away from the music industry as his collaborators continued to rise. Timbaland would go on producing for a multitude of artists across many genres before coming out with another solo album called Shock Value in 2007 and was able to get Magoo for a verse, albeit brief, on the song Board Meeting, before Magoo once again retreated from the spotlight. Magoo spent the latter half of the 2000s decade working behind the scenes through a production company, cultivating producers like Hannon Lane, who co-produced Rihanna's single Rehab, and Tommy Hits, who produced for Pharrell and CeeLo Green. Meanwhile, Timbaland would file suit with Black Round Records in 2009 before parting ways with their label, and from then on, all the work he did with Magoo and as a solo artist would go extinct and wasn't made available to the public until 2021, when the label's owner and Aaliyah's uncle, Barry Hankerson, would release the catalog to streaming platforms for the first time. At some point, Magoo had gotten married and raised his wife's daughter as she were his own. His wife would later state that they first met back in 96 and that even back then, Magoo did not like to go out because it was too much like being at work. But all in all, he liked his privacy away from the world. He had social media for a while, but only on the site Talent Maven, before announcing that he would be leaving that too as it became too much for him. But in his last post in 2010, he made sure to shout out Timbaland and give thanks for his contributions. Magoo was always taking the time out to show appreciation for others. And from here on out, he would only show up on special occasions, like to celebrate a friend's birthday or to perform an old hit, like at the 2012 Shag Fest in Virginia, as he always had love for the big VA. But his bread and butter then became real estate. According to his friend Larry Live, he said once those real estate checks started building in, it was the perfect opportunity for him to disappear. He still had money in his pocket and really didn't have to deal with a bunch of attention. But him disappearing didn't make him immune to scrutiny from the public. And over the last five years, as nostalgia has become ever so rampant, people on social media have voiced negative opinions on Magoo and questioned why he was ever allowed to touch a mic. There was even a popular meme of the 50 worst rappers floating around social media, with Magoo ranking in at number one. The disrespect, man, what? This and other tweets sparked a mass debate online between old school and new school fans. And even rapper Talib Kweli had to chime in. Okay, Magoo. we're not going to have this conversation right now. His voice was nuts to me. Because niggas, this niggas who's a certain age, yeah. 30, yeah. that swear to God then that Magoo was... is someone that I need to have respect for. Magoo is amazing. Rapping. And I know, no, 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 no. Hard. No, I'm going to push back against that. You don't disrespect no. uh, Q-Tip. Who? You don't disrespect Q-Tip. Magoo sound hard. like Q-Tip. He don't sound like Q-Tip. He Q -tip. does not. His voice he can't, can't sound like anybody. <laughs> Magoo rolled with the punches 
and took the hits in silence without ever divulging how he felt. But thankfully, You Know I Got Soul caught up with Magoo in 2020. And in the audio interview, it's like everything that Magoo had kept silent on, he was finally able to let out. He was just waiting on someone to listen. He expressed his feelings that he never really shared with his collaborators about life and about fame. The music business right. is the blessing and the curse. The music business is a promise that can't be kept, which is fame. Fame is a promise that can't be kept. And when you're making those records and people are loving you and you got a number one song and hip hop and all that kind of stuff, from the outside looking in, all those people that we grew up loving, me, Tim, Missy, and all of us, that looked like it was the life. But when I became right. one of those people, I realized, man, hey, man, I might have been better off in my nine to five I had before I left. So I lived right. two different lives. I lived the life before I was Magoo, and I lived the life that I was after Magoo. And being a, a celebrity to me was not fun. That's all the questions that I had. Is there anything that you'd like to add? I really don't want to talk about what I'm into. Now I'm into business, but I don't really want people to really know what I'm doing. On August 11th, 2023, the biggest names in hip hop would come together to celebrate 50 years of hip hop. And two days later, on August 13th, it was announced that Melvin Magoo Barcliffe, who was also 50, had passed away in Williamsburg. The surviving members of the group Playa were the first to break the news before Magoo's wife Miko would make the official statement to the New York Times, stating that Magoo hadn't been feeling well for the past week, but added that he had no known health problems aside from asthma, and said that the coroner's office was investigating the cause of death. She wrote on Facebook, Melvin, your family loves you deeply, and we will never stop missing you. And also wrote that even though the pair were separated since 2015, that he and the family were still very close. Tributes will pour in from Timbaland, Missy, Genuine, P.D. Pablo, and many others, as many industry peers were in disbelief of his sudden death with no apparent cause. And while many speculated his cause of death was from a heart attack, and just as many people assumed that it was brought on by the jab, as of the making of this video, his family have not disclosed his cause of death, and it's unclear if we'll ever truly know, which adds another layer of mystery to an already private individual's legacy. His funeral was slated for September 6th, with no news coverage. It's like the news of his death came and went, with many people not knowing he passed away. And I just want to say, it's eerie looking back on the many notable black acts that passed away at the age of 50. And it's sad to see them all go so young, with Magoo passing just one month and one day after turning 50. Not much else is known about Magoo. He discussed much about his life and upbringing in an interview at the College of William and Mary in 2013 for their hip hop history collection. But his records aren't easily accessible to the general public. His interview with You Know I Got Soul would be the most in-depth look into his career from his own words. Y'all go check it out. He gives props to his peers, as always, and breaks down the importance of artist development and how it's missing in today's musical climate. He also talks about his love for Aaliyah and Static, who he missed so much and was recently reunited with. Rest in peace, Melvin, Magoo, Barcliff. Those you impacted will forever cherish your memory, your kind spirit, and your contributions with your collaborators. You did what most could only dream of, and you got your peace back. This is Justified by Jury. Y'all know how to hit that like, and y'all know how to hit that subscribe. If you want to, do so. And I'ma catch y'all in the next video.